They can hear the song. No, we gonna hear the song. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. I'm a black man, black man, I'm sorry. I'm the black man, black man, I'm sorry. I'm the black man, black man, I'm sorry. I'm the black man, I'm the black man, I'm the black man, black man. Look at black, look at black. What's good, y'all? Welcome to another episode of Black Man Do Talk, where we have overdue topics from a black man's perspective. It's your boy, Street. Oh, yeah. What's up, y'all? My name is Elisha. You guys here know who I am, but for the podcast, I'm Elisha. Okay. And we have a special co-host this episode. <laughs> what's good? Yeah, what's going on? This is Ezekiel. I just want y'all to know, Elisha is too cool. He has a toothpick currently in his mouth right now, so that's why he sounds laid back, he is laid back, and he has a toothpick in his mouth. Yes, yes, the just toothpick. To toothpick is the number one sign of, a, of either <laughs> a, a uncle, yeah, somebody's cheating in spades, or a player. <laughs> I ain't never seen anybody with a toothpick in it. Uh, like, it wasn't cheating in spades, so don't trust them. <laughs> You can't trust about a toothpick. So, right. um, this episode, we do have a dope co-host. Ezekiel, tell the people a little bit about yourself, what you do, what you represent, and how people can get in touch with you. Uh, well, my name is Ezekiel. Um, not too much about me, man. I am a friend. I'm a brother. I'm a husband, first and foremost. I got a beautiful wife, five beautiful kids. Okay, he, he, he drops them on that. So, that I mean, that lets you know that that's fire. Okay. Uh, I do a lot of stuff. I just call myself a creative Christian. Everything I do for the sole purpose of glorifying the king. And uh, I love uh, developing people as well. So, that's another thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, um, essentially, I think it'd be dope if you introduced how you and Elisha met because it's going to bleed into the topic of the day. That's hilarious. Oh, okay. I almost forgot. So Elisha originally, I mean, we had some, I guess, some encounters before that. But I'd had a dating show, a Christian dating show where I had people, you know, submit themselves. And Elisha was one of the men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Elisha was one of the men that submitted, and I was like, "Oh yeah, let's keep him locked in." Uh, unfortunately, we uh, fortunately we had an amazing conversation mm-hmm. that you know I feel like it would have shaken things in the culture if it was released, but the footage was lost. So God <laughs> forced us to be in communion so that we yeah. can have further conversations in the future. Forced. Forced. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. So. Uh, it's interesting. I think after you started releasing the content of like the blind dating experience, you know, yeah. people started to consider you like either a dating guru or somebody that was passionate about hookups. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like, right. so, so how, how, did, how, did, how did that like kind of transpire? Well, I mean, to an extent, they're not wrong. Me and my wife have been passionate about singles, man. Um, I don't know. I guess when people get married, they forget about everybody that's in the struggle of singlehood, but we just don't forget. And we're friends with singles and we want to see them married if they desire to be married. And I don't know why people aren't gung ho as married people to see their single friends be married, but we just have a passion to see our single friends married if they desire for that. And so, yeah, we've been we've been doing things like that since before we were married, since 2007 and eight. So it's not new for us. Uh, so we're not gurus. We just are passionate about single people. So so why, like most uh, matchmakers of the culture today, are y'all bailing out? Of this, okay, we're not playing of okay. relationships, so we're not abandoning well, he singles. Y'all matchmakers. He said matchmakers. No, 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 no. no it's, it's like professional matchmakers that are quitting because they're like, "Yo, the game is messed up, and we don't want to deal with this anymore." See, he's exposing personal conversations. So, <laughs> what I said was, "Yeah, hey, like yo. I like no, I, I probably said I give up on humanity." It was just like, um, it's it's really really tough this day and age when on like not on a professional or on a grand scale where we have events and things like that. It's less about that, but more about you know in our personal time when we try to with you know set people up just to communicate and we you know talk to people about other people. No one wants to have conversations with anyone. You know, you know, they might ask, hey, let me get their social media profile. They might say, all right, let me see a couple pictures. And then it's like flat out, ah, I'm straight because I don't like his jacket or I don't like the way he wears his shoes or I don't like her hair. Like I've literally heard exactly. she's perfect, but the way she wears her hair. And I'm like, okay, I get it, but that, 
that's so transient. So, I mean, I, I, when I say I, I give up, it's just almost like it wasn't like when, when me and my wife got together, I guess it was a little bit of a different time. The world wasn't ruled by Instagram. My space was the biggest thing when we start, first started talking. So social media didn't rule. And like the illusion, I call it the illusion of options, didn't exist in a way where you feel like you could swipe and find the next girl of your dreams. And so when you found someone that was, you know, at least you, that piqued your interest to have a conversation, you might have that conversation. And I feel like people are less willing to have that conversation because the illusion of the next thing being at their fingertips. Indeed, indeed. Which kind of goes to my, you know, factual theory of the fact that... Uh, factual theory. Yes. Okay. Factual theory. TM. That's mine. <laughs> I own that. Okay. So uh, I believe that uh, modern day, the men have too many options and are unwilling to commit, and the women... Um, have high expectations and are seeking Greek gods that do not exist. Greek gods? <laughs> Absolutely. Wait, Absolutely. You said, you said the women's expectations are too high? Yeah, like they, they the, on average, the women I talk to, when I ask what they desire, they give this long list, and I'm like, okay, cool. Like, what's the make or break things? Make or break things are just like, oh, he's got to, you know, love God, easy. He's got to be a leader. Easy. It's not easy, bro. People that love God and, and, and are leaders? Oh, I, 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 have, I have a whole squad of those. Okay. Now, the thing is, once you start getting past all the, all the remedial stuff, I'm like, okay, bet. I, I, I remember, I, I, like I said, I've, I've asked like a, a woman like, who's 5'4". I was like, hey, so how, how tall are you? She said, I'm 5'4". I said, how tall does your man have to be? And she said, oh, oh, he no, no shorter than 5'9". And I said, are you having struggle in relationships? She said, yes, I can't find nobody. I said, because you're literally overlooking people that are 5'8", 5'7", 5'6", 5'5", and 5'4". What if you had your 5'5 five, five king waiting for you? 5'5 <laughs> five, five king. <laughs> Talk to him about the 5'5 five, five king. They ain't ready. Five, they, five they, 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 they overlooking their 5'5 five, five king. Because yeah. he's so short. Literally, it's body shaming. But we ain't want to talk about that because it's because it's what Cause we got to stop right there. Okay, it's, no, yeah. Get, get. <laughs> look, and so let's get into the body shaming. And that's, the body shaming. Oh, look, oh, look, look. The body shaming culture. I, I, I do feel like body shaming men is almost like a standard, um, in like the culture today. That's just, that's just that's just where I'm at and how I see things transpire. It's not because of the the, the aspect of anything we can control on our end it just seems as though things like height i cannot change my height you know or even on a more adult level you know what i'm saying like if somebody could have even like an average sized uh member you know oh be, my like average is below average to the average woman mm. if you ask in the same way height average height is below average to the expectations or the standards that people are asking for. So, mm -hmm. so, so do you, do you, like, do y'all think having a list is an issue? Having a list is an issue? Oh, absolutely. Well, so, and, and it's, like I said, I think that preferences are cool. Um, okay. But even if there are preferences, when we're talking about non-negotiables, I, like I said, if you have non-negotiables, I think that's cool. But for everything you put on your list, that therefore decreases your dating pool. Even if he's a man of God. Once you put man of God, that decreases your dating pool. I'm not saying this is a bad or good thing. I'm just saying these are just reality. The more you're, you're strapped and, and, and tied to your list, the more your dating pool decreases. So if you are having bad experiences on finding people to date, maybe it's because you have a long list that you're not willing to sacrifice. Mm. I'm a, I'm a person of statistics and logic. It got real quiet. I'm a person of statistics and logic. I could be wrong, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we going to talk for like five more minutes and then get into the audience because we got so a nice little live studio audience. Say what's up, live studio audience. Indeed, so indeed. Got some beautiful black people in the building. Is, is that why you feel like Christian women are bad daters? <laughs> oh, my God. I've been asked this hey, every I'm week. I'm not involved. Yes, I've been asked this. No, look, this is what Mitchell said. No, no, I don't think Christian women are bad daters. I know Christian women are terrible daters. <laughs> but oh I also God. know... Christian men are also terrible daters. Look, I talked to a, I talked to a woman the other day, um, and I asked, I was, I was like, "Yo, like, like, are you are you seeking a date?" She's like, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm just waiting for somebody." And I'm like, "Okay, bet." And she works sixty hours a week, beautiful woman, feminine. And I was like, "Okay, so where are you making yourself known?" Because I would now to be known, you were available. You work sixty hours a week. Oh, she said, "I mean, I'm I'm on the train." 
you know, I'm, I, I go to Target. I'm like, cool, but in passing, are you expecting to find this person on your list in Target on the train? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and these are, these are t- typically tend to be women who are double degree, 30 plus, you know what I'm saying? Amazing attributes, amazing qualities. It's just the aspect. Now, you ask them, how many times have you dated in the last two years? Oh, two or three. And it's like they're so tied to what happened in those two or three that it's like, okay, because of my bad experience in this, I'm now hurt and I have to recover. And there's going to be a longer time in between I date again, which then extends the time in years. And I'm just like, all right, bet. I don't think whatever we're doing collectively on the male side and the women's side is effective because when relationships aren't happening, when marriages aren't combining, and even on the aspect of past that, as we talked about two weeks ago, when when marriages are failing, I think that it starts with the church and our education of these things and our community and our ability to speak about what's going on in a transparent way because a lot of these conversations are just not happening. I agree with what you said with the teaching because I just feel like um, I, someone mentioned something about, you know, it's hard to date in the church environment because once you date one person and it doesn't work out, trying to date someone else, first of all, the gossip starts to spread and, yeah. you know, you get stigmatized because this didn't work out and people know why it didn't work out. And then it just becomes weird to date even within your local body. So that's weird. And there's not a good it's not um, curated well, like the atmosphere is not curated well. But also, I remember when I did like a, a poll on my Instagram about So if a a man that you did not know on the street or whatever the case may be, you know, introduced himself to you and said, hey, I I, I would like your number. I would love to communicate with you more just to see what you're about. Ninety percent of the women that responded said, I would never give a man a number, my number on the street or any information of me unless we had an in-depth conversation. And I was just like, but what if this was at the gas station or it was in passing or, you know, at the grocery store. Well, unless I know fully what he's about, then he's not going to get any contact information from me. And I was just like, oh, well, then the, how is he going to get to know you if he didn't have the time to have a conversation with you at the gas pump? I, I didn't really bang, understand. Bang, and I was wondering, bang, like, bang, who, who taught bang. you? Who, who taught <laughs> who you that? Taught you who told this? you that? And so it's, I, I mean, I get it. Maybe, maybe people are just like, well, I, I can't. It's, I don't know. People are going to hate me for this one, too. It, it falls in line with the whole uh, uh, the, the private page thing. Don't shoot me. But some, the logic behind it is just like, well, if he really loves me and really wants me, then he'll request me. And after I look at his page and see if I'm willing to accept him, then I might accept. I'm like, ho, oh, ho, oh, brother, ho, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, you, whoa, wait, but you're okay. you could judge him and choose whether to accept him, but you don't even give equal access for him to be able to judge if he wants to. I like this stuff. Like some, some of this stuff is not logical to me. And I think this, that, that makes things very, um, um, and we could have, if you want to argue, I'm a, I can argue. You want to argue, I'll argue you down about the conversation. You don't want to argue with me about that because I will explain to you how illogical the thought process is if you're if you're trying to enter the dating world or try to make yourself known in that atmosphere, then trying to make your only page a page that is inaccessible, um, you know, it just didn't doesn't make that logical sense. So I just think there needs to be more conversation, more open conversations to what what expect, expectations should look like, what a, a natural, organic dynamic looks like to build communication and friendship. That's it. And I think that um, hearing your perspective is dope. From, for Always for me, you know, I tap in with you all the time, not even just on relationships, but in general, because uh, when I look at, man, what does it mean to be a dope black father? Mm-hmm. You know, especially in, like, the Christian community, Christian black community, Christian hip-hop community, uh, people connected to the spoken word community as well. I'm like, man, truly, I think the general consensus is Zeke is killing it. You know, um, nobody looks at you as perfect. Nobody looks at you as like, it? we were like, yo, when we read the scriptures and then we see you, there's something there to be honored. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, like this, this is praiseworthy based on how you conduct yourself, how you love your wife, how your children are, how your children respond, how you're able to display your children in a respectable way online, things like that, you know. And so could you, uh, before we get to the smoke session, kind of just give like a little bit of history behind just you and your wife? So it's easy, I think. It's easy to appreciate what's seen on on Instagram. It's Mm -hmm. easy to 
say Zeke is a dope black father and Zeke has a dope black family. Well, I primarily, I think my kids are cute and I think my wife is beautiful. And so I think it's easy to appreciate it from the outside uh, looking in. And I think while that is great, I think to create uh, this idea of relationship goals from seeing, you know, pictures, from hearing people talk on podcasts, from seeing people do sermons and from seeing people even out, uh, out and about and having lunch, I think you get a, a picture, but you don't get the whole story. And so I think it's important for us as individuals to open up our lives uh, with other individuals who are in the struggle, who are, who are single, who are going through it, who are young and who are married, and tell them the reality of what it looks like behind the photos, behind the, you know, the glamour of what it looks like to be a Christian couple because it's not easy, it's not perfect, um, you know, it's not like the picture. It's not always beautiful. The kitchen ain't always clean. Nika knows that for, for a fact. Um, but, but, but straight up, like, I think what, what, what's even more beautiful is the fact that we're okay leaning on God and depending on him, that we need him just as much as you do as a single person, just as much as a person who just got in your relationship, just as much as the uh, older couple that's been in a relationship for 60 years. And I think that would make the community dope and not just the couple on IG.